Mm. We're in the best position to hold insurance companies accountable when our integrity is beyond question. This is the one thing no one is talking about. You have to understand, the insurance industry is the second most powerful lobby in America. All insurance fraud prosecution in America is done to defend insurance companies. I think greed is the biggest problem in the industry on all ends. Greed, contractors greed, insurance greed, it's all greed. And who gets hurt? The policyholder. Policy and holder. what is the, the number one rule when we talk about integrity is the litmus test you use is what is in the best interest of the policyholder. All right, guys, today we're just playing catch up with the Doc Queen APA. Haven't talked to you on a podcast for quite a bit. Um, you just came back from Tennessee, you said? Yeah, we were down there with our other nonprofit helping uh, tornado survivors. And while I was there, I got a chance to put on my APA hat and do a little bit of press. So it always works out well when uh, we just happen to be somewhere where people desperately need our help and we're ready to talk about the APA message always. How many events you do per year? Like how many catastrophic events do we have in the country? Do you have like a data, you know, like what triggers your uh, attention? Well, I'll be clear first. There's no connection between the APA and USDR. USDR is something we did before okay. APA even existed. Um, you know, when we lost our home in New Jersey, people came from all over the country to help our community and it meant so much. It meant so much to know because you, when you're in a disaster, you know, you suffer in silos. You, even though your neighbor's wiped out, you are very much alone. So to know that you have the love of the country means a lot. To have people show up who have experience, who've been through it and survived means a lot. And, um, you know, it's just the big issue with us. It's just our way of paying it forward. But there's no connection with APA. We just happen to be the same people involved but we don't use any APA budget. But again, while we're there, we, you know, I will throw on the APA hat if we get a chance to speak at a town hall, if we get a chance to uh, speak to the press, which in Tennessee we did. So we are a very small, you know, nonprofit, volunteer only, nobody gets paid. You know, if we can do two disasters a year, deploy to, uh, and then we're constantly following up with the people that we met with in the past because we do help them get uh, we help them get set up as a 501c3 so they can raise money tax deductible and, you know, the survivors there and, and sort of, you know, teach a survivor to fish kind of a thing. So, you know, maybe two a year that we'll go to actively. What decides whether we can go? You know, my first commitment is to APA. Uh, and then when we have a break, when we have time, luckily about APA, I can work from anywhere. So if mm -hmm. we drive our van down, you know, I, I, I will work from the van if we are, you know, in the area. I can always do my work. But the big issue is, you know, what's our bandwidth? We have family commitments. We, you know, it's it's difficult. Got and then it. we serve uh, winter clothing to the homeless on Sundays uh, at home in uh, two areas, Asbury Park, New Jersey, and Camden, New Jersey. So that's a little bit easier to do. It's a couple hours on a Sunday. Not a big deal, obviously. We've driven our van to Houston for 27 hours to, you know, Louisiana, Florida, North Carolina, Kentucky. Um, that's a little bit harder uh, to do. And if we get a chance, if we can fly, obviously it makes it so much easier. What are the worst events did we have in 2023? I don't think we had like major hurricanes. We had some coming to Florida, but nothing like Irma, nothing like super big, correct? I mean, I, I thought... I thought that, uh, you know, when you're talking about 23, no, it wasn't really that horrible. Uh, certainly, um, we've seen way worse. Uh, and again, we keep following up with the people that we've dealt with in the past. I mean, in general, I know we deal with a lot of storms. Uh, you know, your industry deals with a lot of wind events, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of not a lot of roofing going on in floods, but sometimes they'll coincide. Uh, I mean, I always personally think that fire is the worst mm -hmm. um, fire will leave you, you know, look, I lost my home in a flood and a, and a, you know, super storm Sandy. I was able to kind of pick through and find a couple of pictures. I was able to find a couple of 
mementos because those are the things that hurt the most when you lose them right hmm. you know it hurts the most when you lose the picture of your grandparents or something that's been in the family i was able to find some of those. in fire we see people left with nothing but a chimney and a foundation uh it's and whatever isn't ruined by the fire the water and the smoke get uh it's it's difficult so those are generally there's always fires going on out west we don't always get to deploy to them as much as uh, we'd like because the distances are far, our time and our resources are limited, but, you know, we, we do what we can. My next question is, as far as insurance and predictability of the events, because insurance, as weird or cringy as it sounds, they predict losses. They should budget for losses. It doesn't sound right. It's kind of cutting your ear, but still, my question is, how many are planned and predictable events we have by insurance companies and how many are above budgets? Like I've heard a lot of this year uh, controversy around, you know, Hawaii fires. And last year, we, I believe we have California fires. So uh, this year, controversy is like people trying to raise money. You know, we have Rock and I think uh, like a few other celebrities with trying to raise money to help victims in Hawaii. Like, and people like, why are we doing this? Why are we raising $50 million for this cause? Like, why not insurance companies are not doing it? Like, things like this. Is it above the budget? Or w when does it really kick in? Like, predictable loss versus above where a government or someone else has to step in and bail out people? Honestly, I think government has to bail, step in and bail out people regularly. Uh, and personally, I think it's too much. I, I, you know, how the insurance industry predicts because they do all that predictive analytics and, you know, they have unlimited resources to do those projects. There's unlimited people having their own businesses that are helping them do those projections are always willing to sell data to one of the wealthiest industries in the country. And obviously the insurance industry would rather distribute profits than hold reserves. I think some companies do a better job than others. You know, when you're talking about the Florida companies, personally, I don't think they do that at all. I think they're draining those companies left and right. But I'll let me and let me just say this. And this is something that maybe you and I can talk about in the future. I've spent like the last year focusing on integrity. Uh, when I, I speak to thousands of people in, you know, all over the country every year. And whenever I talk to somebody on the carrier side, contractors, public adjusters, attorneys, my first slide is always, your integrity matters most. Mm. We're in the best position to hold insurance companies accountable when our integrity is beyond question. My next thing I wanna do to add to that is start talking about mitigation. Personally, I think we rely too much on insurance. Personally, I think that whether you, whatever you believe it is, a natural cycle or man-made or act of God, Climate change has shown us that there is going to be more and more natural disasters and more and the, not just the frequency, but the intensity. And it's time we start letting people know you're responsible to protect your family. You know, and start our government should start to deal with mitigation and home hardening. It should be something to the level of a priority of national defense, because I would much rather spend a little extra money on a roof, the right roofing tile, spend a little extra money, get you know shutters on my windows or wind rated glass, spend a little extra money to elevate my home, then have to go fight with the insurance company about who's gonna pay to clean up the mess, apply for government grants. I've lived that life, it is horrible. And if we can have a certain percentage of people that we can save from that. you know, Look, nothing's gonna help you if an F4 tornado has a direct hit which we were in a lot of homes in Tennessee just a couple of days ago. Th nothing's gonna help you with that, except maybe a good shelter in your basement. At least you can come out with your family alive. But there's a lot of people that are impacted by these natural disasters and even storms that could be avoided if we just spent a little bit of time and a little bit of extra money to build our homes right, to armor them for whatever type of peril is prevalent in your area whether it's hail, whether it's wind, whether it's flood, whether it's fire. Uh, and I promise you, I promise you, it is way cheaper 
and way easier to be proactive and responsible up front than it is to, to go through these disasters and have your family go through it and deal with the financial ruin and the mess and the fighting with the government, the fighting with your insurance company, the trauma that goes through. People, children go through trauma. People themselves go through trauma. It has horrible impacts. It's just way easier to spend the money up front. And I'm sorry, that's not maybe necessarily the question you asked, but that's my soapbox coming up for the, <laughs> for the future. And hopefully you will join me on that. Sure. Uh, because I'm certainly, you know, having people spend a couple extra bucks to get the right roofing system on would help your audience. And it certainly helps your customers. hundred uh, percent. With that, with that note, uh, I actually like it, taking it on integrity and everything else. Let's switch to Florida situation because Florida sets the stage for the rest of the country when it comes to battling insurance companies, public opinion on insurance companies and contractors fraud debate. So in, in Florida this year, we've seen like never before pointing fingers. Contractors say it's insurance companies who are fraud and bad and contract and insurance companies say, no, because of the roofers, we go out of business. They point fingers like nowhere in the country. And because of that legislation changes and what's gonna happen in Florida next, most likely gonna happen in the rest of the country next. So what do you what what's your take on the whole situation there? You know, Florida is unique in many ways. I'm outraged at a lot of the things I see in Florida that I know exist to a degree in other states, but nothing like Florida. I mean, the saying, and I don't know if I agree with it, but somebody just said this, you know, Florida is a sunny place for shady people. And I don't necessarily agree with that 100%, but some of the things I see in Florida there is a lot of finger pointing because listen, here's what's going on in Florida. I will give you the rundown and then we talk about the impact and the finger pointing. The obviously, you know, the, the Florida is on the point of climate change and sea level rise. Uh, they tend to get more natural disasters than anybody else. That's going to have an adverse impact on the insurance market down there. It's going to have an adverse impact on premiums. But there are a lot of other things going on, Dimitri, in Florida. One of the things is something like 80% of the insurance companies in Florida are domiciled in Florida. Uh, and that's way out of whack compared to what other states are doing. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, except these are not really the state farms and the all states of the world who, as much as we get complaints about, you can say they are legitimately in the business of indemnifying people for their losses at a reasonable profit. Uh, and again, we get complaints about the big carriers, but I can say, having worked for one for 27 years, you know, they really are in that business. Now, we don't always agree with how they do it. Some of these carriers in Florida, in my opinion, they are just there to do what we call premium harvesting. Uh, these are companies that are owned by hedge funds, by private equity funds, by groups of investors. Many of them are anchored offshore in, the, in Bermuda, in the Cayman Islands, which are two of the biggest tax shelters in the world. Mm. And they are not necessarily there to take care of policyholders. What we're watching is, and I can send you graphics for this if you want to intersperse that with this. It might be helpful for your sure. audience. Yes, please. What we're watching are these private equity funds and hedge funds at the top and they'll own a holding company. And the holding company owns the insurance company. And they also own seven or eight or 10 or 12 other affiliate companies, managing general agencies, third-party administrators. Sometimes they even own their own reinsurance companies. Uh, they'll own restoration companies. And the insurance company is the one that generates all of the profit. But you, you know that's the engine that generates the cash flow. But you can't leave that money in the insurance company because, number one, the state has profit caps. Number one, two, there's a lot of regulatory oversight in any state in an insurance company. You know, regulators want to see uh, your reports. They want to they can do inspections on, uh, you know, five years max average. It's supposed to be. And there's a lot of oversight. And in any minute, if all your money's in that bucket of the insurance company, a hurricane Ian can come and clean it all out. So the goal is to get the money 
out of the insurance company. And what we're watching wow. is excessive executive compensation, obscene ownership dividends. And here, I'll give you one example. Uh, one year, there was an, an insurance CEO in Florida who was the highest paid CEO in the country. His company managed a fraction of what the all uh, state farm manages a fraction a pebble of policies so how much give me dollar amount how much did they manage and how much did he get paid that year which i think was 2017 state farm ceo made 13 million dollars this individual made 27 million dollars huh. double double so now the other thing we're watching is companies that are use, hiring their own affiliates to help with claims. Managing general agencies many times take 25 to 30% right off the top of you know premiums. And then they'll hire their own third party administrator. And then the, they may hire their own, they'll buy their own reinsurance. They may hire their own restoration company. And they're using that to shift the money. We have a criminal case in two states with one company. We had a whistleblower come forward and he said, yeah, he showed us invoices they're hiring their own restoration company to do services after a disaster and paying them three to four times market rates. That is not business. That is profit shifting. It's a profit shifting shell game. And several companies have been caught doing that. And we suspect that it's widespread in the market. So what happens is they'll use ex excessive executive compensation. They'll use ownership dividends. They will hire their own affiliates that have common ownership. Remember, it all goes back to that holding company, which goes to investment groups. Hmm. And then if they leave just enough money in the insurance company to keep the regulators happy, and there's a lot of questions about what's going on there, if the company doesn't go out of business, that's great. They keep premium harvesting, right? Skimming the state of premiums. If the company does go out of business, well, guess what? They've already got all their profits drained up the line. They stick the Florida Insurance Guarantee Association with their open claims and other states like Louisiana that they may be doing business in. And they will dump their policies into citizens and they march away having never lost a penny. Uh, and this is the dominant issue. Now, again, there's other things that are real that are impacting premiums and you know businesses in Florida, such as the environment, you know, such as the, uh, the the sea level rise and the climate change. There are other things such as inflation for rebuilding costs. That's all real. That's all happening. There's a lot of people saying it's, you know, frivolous litigation from the attorneys. But this is the one thing no one is talking about. And it's come up before in Florida. There's actually, and we're not watching the Florida regulators follow the money when it goes. When one of these companies go under, I'll give you an idea. In 2022, before Hurricane Ian even hit, six insurance companies in Florida went out of business. Now, they hadn't had a named hurricane since 2018. In four years, the insurance industry, this is homeowners insurance, collected billions of dollars in premiums. In the four years from Hurricane Michael in 2018 to Ian in 2022, billions of dollars. Where is all that money? Where did all that money go? How are they caught? You know, again, hey, it's been four years. There's no storm. And again, even before the storm, six companies went under. Wow. How is that possible? And guess what? You and I ask, how is that possible? Why are the Florida regulators not asking, how is that possible? What's your answer to it? What's your suspicion? Is it just bureaucracy and no one is investigating or we're talking about corruption? You know, we're, it could be a combination of all of it. You know, look, I know for a fact every state is, you know, having financial issues. So all of the, you know, the insurance department, the department, of, the Office of Insurance Regulation, the uh, Department of Financial Services that regulate all this in Florida, you know, they're probably understaffed, underpaid, under-resourced, like every other state department. So there's challenges. Uh, above and beyond that, there the you have to understand the insurance ind industry is the second most powerful lobby in America. They are just behind the top 
lobby. They spend just behind, which is big pharma. And that carries a lot of juice and a lot of power. And there's a lot of incentive for elected officials and perhaps the employees that work for them to look the other way or perhaps not aggressively go after these things. Here, I'll give you an example. We look a lot at insurance commissioners and everybody holds insurance commissioners at very high uh, esteem. They uh, have a lot of responsibility. They're in charge of a lot, not just cracking down on the insurance agents and companies, but also making sure there's enough viable participants to make sure that, you know, you have a state like Louisiana or Florida with companies leaving. They've got to have enough that come in to keep the competition. But somewhere between 37 and 50 percent of insurance commissioners leave public service. They do a term or two as commissioner and they go to work where? In the insurance industry. And they call that the revolving door. It doesn't just happen in insurance where today you're in charge of regulating this industry and, you know, cracking the whip and holding them accountable. Tomorrow you go take a high paying job with that industry. Wow. The Florida insurance commissioner, Dave Altmeyer, suddenly in December, in the middle of the state's worst ever insurance crisis that anybody can remember, left office. Middle of December. Now, a couple things. Can we guess where Mr. Altmeyer went to work? <laughs> Three months later in March, he announced two insurance company jobs. One, insurance industry related jobs, I guess I would say is more accurate. One is with the state's highest grossing insurance lobbyist. Two is on a board, a part time position on a board of directors for a, uh, I believe it was a, an offshore reinsurance company. We don't know what he's making. We know people in his position last year made $400,000 a year for a part time job. Another piece about him leaving, again, this was the insurance commissioner who is in charge of cracking down and making sure the insurance market was viable, had integrity, making sure the insurance companies were not abusing policyholders, which there is an insane amount of complaints against insurance companies in Florida from policyholders who feel they're not being treated fairly. The other issue is two weeks after he left office, a new law went into a place. It was a six-year cooling off period where if you left public service, you were not allowed to lobby the agency that you were just employed with. This is one of the things that we do to solve the, you know, the bias that comes with the revolving door, hmm. right? Because people are in an agency, they're regulating an industry, and two weeks later, they're working for that industry. Do, do you think they just found out when they got the job offer that that's what happens? No, there's a whole history of these insurance commissioners leaving office to very high paid jobs. And they know that when they go in. And again, not everyone takes it, depending on what study you're looking at, it's somewhere between 37 to 50% of insurance commissioners go that route, but they know where their bread is going to be buttered when they leave office. And there are several studies, I'm certainly happy to send you if you'd like to see them, by some very brilliant people uh, that show that there is bias. They actually went back, they found what they call the revolvers, who worked for went to work for the industry they were just regulating, and then they examined their history while they were actually in office as insurance commissioner, and they found significant bias in favor of the insurance industry. Um, one of the people who did a study, Dr. Anna Tenekinaiva, uh, you may possibly be able to pronounce that name better than me. Um, I doubt it. <laughs> is actually an economist on the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. And she had done this study and we just had her speak at the APA summit in Dallas last month. Um, you know, brilliant, brilliant woman. These are not just like, you know, angry public adjusters writing these studies. These are brilliant people. Uh, and, you know, so obviously we know there's a bias there. Obviously, we know that when it comes to elected officials, if you want to go places, you're going to want that insurance money. The Florida, the insurance industry has spread somewhere around seventy four million dollars around Florida in the last few years. $2.2 million to the CFO, who is the one that runs the insurance department, the OIR, and the D Department of Financial Services. Four plus million dollars to Governor DeSantis. $19 million to the Florida Republican Party, and the Republican Party runs Florida. And we haven't even begun to look into 
the uh, how much has gone to individual legislators who appear to be in the business of passing pro-insurer legislation. Um, so when you want to point fingers, there is some, again, you know, obviously there's some bureau bureaucratic inefficiency. Obviously they're underpaid and understaffed to a degree. I feel sorry for the rank and file. Um, and then above and beyond, there are many people who allege there is impact from that money. Now, are there lawyers who are filing frivolous litigation? I'm sure just like in any state. Are there roofers who are running scams? You know, here, here's a free roof. Your insurance company will pay for it. Are there people that are knocking holes in roofs? I'm sure that's happening. Are there public adjusters who are exaggerating their claims? I'm sure that's happening. That's why we talk about integrity, because I can't tell you how hard those people make my job, Dimitri, because I go and say the insurance companies and their vendors they're hiring are committing fraud and they can swing a dead cat and hit five roofers who are scamming. Let me ask you about this. Let me like, how often do you see or like as APA, how often do you guys see contractors fraud? Did you see that? Uh, so. Two stories that Roofing Insights did this year, kind of big, like the guy in Colorado making a dance, got caught on security camera. And a second one that's big, very big. And uh, I had to ask you, otherwise I'll be biased if I don't. See my story, uh, Steve Soleil, like, you know, they collected a lot of insurance monies. Uh, like we actually have, I have over 15 homeowners that gave them deposit over a year ago asking, what can I do? My question, like in a CMR case, is it reasonable for CMR to, to charge 25% cancellation fees, for example, when they cannot produce the jobs and they collected insurance checks? How are we better than insurance companies when insurance companies paid contractor and contractor does not do the work and mismanage the money? Of course, it's not you know, as fraudulent as insurance companies in the first place, but now we have insurance companies actually paying and contractor doing. How often do does APA expose contractors, I guess? Never. No. Uh, we, we are in the business and we're the only organization in America that develops cases against the carrier side. Uh, and, and, and look, I personally had a contractor try to take advantage of me uh, did take advantage of my friend, a 62-year-old man, who to this day, 10 years after Superstorm Sandy, is not home. Mm. Uh, we had, you know, I know that happens. It pisses me off. Anybody who takes advantage of storm victims, you know, or anybody, consumers in general, I have a problem with. But when we started the APA, and you, I will remember fondly, were at the table when we had that first meeting, right, down in Louisiana. Yes, sir. And the idea was this, all insurance fraud prosecution in America is done to defend insurance companies, 100%. And if you, if anybody, I challenge any prosecutor in America, if you've prosecuted an insurance company, please show it to me. And I don't mean people that like agents who keep premiums because they're stealing from the insurance company. You know, executives who embezzle. Yeah, people who steal from the insurance company Get, invest, get arrested quickly. But the reason why this happens is because insurance prosecutors don't go out, Dimitri, and look for fraud. It gets walked into them by insurance company SIUs, special investigation units. And they're the ones that have acted, and every insurance company has an SIU. It's full of you know detectives and forensics experts and computer specialists because people do steal from insurance company. That is real, right? It's wrong. All fraud is wrong. It happens on all sides. It's all wrong. But unfortunately, it's not investigated on all sides. The insurance companies are the ones that are turning over all of the cases I've talked to. Prosecutor after prosecutor, insurance commissioner after insurance commissioner say all of our cases come mostly from the insurance companies. And for some reason, the insurance companies don't turn themselves in. So if you're a prosecutor and 100 percent of your cases are, you know, people stealing from the insurance company, that's going to create some bias, right? Mm. You're going to do a 20 year career and all you've ever heard your whole life is, you know, from insurance company lobbyists saying they're stealing from us, they're stealing your whole career. You're going to believe that that's hundred percent of the market. So when we invented the APA, when we came up with the idea, it was 
nobody is going after this segment. You know, it is, there's a, there's a, I'm an old guy in the eighties in business. You know, everybody had to read Sun Tzu, The Art of War. It was like the business manual. Mm -hmm. And there's a line from Sun Tzu that says, all warfare is based on deception. Deception and deflection is a common military tactic. So it is the right hand pointing the finger at the left hand saying, look what they're doing. Look at those dirty scheming contractors. Look at the public adjusters. Look at all these homeowners stealing from us. And while the entire prosecution community is gaslighted and looking over here, nobody's watching what the insurance industry is doing. So that's why we started the APA. Now, to answer your question, I do get complaints about roofing companies. I do get complaints about, you know, this, that, that one, even policy owners. I have no doubt that exists. I've lived it personally. But we have to. And if you remember the term we used when we had that first meeting, we called it the rifle shot. We have to be laser focused. In the military, we call it, it's called mission creep. You know, we go into Somalia to secure the docks because the food that's coming in to aid in the, in the humanitarian crisis there is getting stolen by warlords. So we're there. That's good. It can come in. The food's getting distributed. But next thing you know, we start creeping. Now we're chasing warlords in the neighborhoods. And now we have Black Hawk Down and 19 dead Americans. So mission discipline is very important. So I generally don't hear about it. It does happen. And I do have, you know, everyone's pointing fingers at each other because you're all competition. And then the other piece I will say is this. I'm not a roofer. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a public adjuster. I was a financial advisor for 30 years and I come from the victim space. I was victimized by insurance carrier fraud and engineer, the engineer they hired. You cannot be an executive or on the board of directors of the APA if you make any money in the claims business. That's one of the things we put into place to make sure that there's no conflict of interest. There's no, pro there's no profit motives. Only right? sponsors. Uh, members. Members. So members yeah. can sponsor you, but not... Um, members pay dues. That which funds our mission. We don't, uh, we don't take any money from the government. We don't take any money from the insurance industry. Uh, we try to do everything we can to make sure that we are as clean as possible. Another thing we put in place, it's in our bylaws, we don't give referrals out. Like I have a consumer call me and say, and we in our literature it says, we recommend you hire an APA member. And then people will say, well, can you refer me to a roofer who's an APA member? Can't do it. Uh, because people have to be able to look at me and look at our leadership and say, look, we're not running our own roofing company or public adjusting company. And are we taking leads for ourselves? Are we making decisions that in, impact our profit? You know, I make my own shitty nonprofit salary, no matter what decision I make. So there can be no influence on that. And then the other piece is it can't be, you know, what's in it for me? You're, you're joining the APA and we're giving you referrals. People will have to worry about, am I giving my friend referral? Oh, I'll give some referrals in Minnesota to Dmitri and he'll do a cool little story and say wonderful things. That has to be eliminated, you know, not just in the market for the carriers and the prosecutors, but for our own members. People have to know that integrity is important and we've built these systems in. So to get to your question, you know, I may get complaints, but we don't dig into them. Uh, and I live by a thing that if I didn't see something happen, it probably didn't happen the way somebody's telling me. You know, if what? I didn't hear something said, probably isn't being said that way would you remove a sponsor or a member of APA like a contractor if he gets prosecuted for insurance fraud for example 100 percent. so you guys do that and the, and the and the emphasis is on prosecuted Prosecute. because because we they, they love to lock you people up i just want you to know that i want your audience to know you are a target uh mm -hmm. when you say everyone's pointing fingers at each other you're right except one finger, the insurance industry has billions to spend on advertising. They spend 15 billion a year projected in 2024 for digital advertising alone. That carries a lot of power. You're standing on a soapbox yelling into the wind, hey, insurance companies are stealing, and they have a megaphone. You know, their voice is way louder and they have way more ability. So, you know, you're, you're outmatched and you're outnumbered. And if you look at the advertising 
you look at what goes out there constantly report contractor fraud you see that in disaster zones all over the place you see the little roadside signs you see billboards you know you'll hear radio and tv ads and they constantly use this language hooked contractor dirty contractor shady contractor and you should be pissed about that number one you should be pissed at the scummy people who are not doing business the right way we know they exist and number two you should be pissed that the insurance industry has such a loud voice to be able to gaslight the community because how many times do your do your kids your customers your neighbors have to see the word dirty contractor crooked contractor contractor fraud see pictures of contractors in handcuffs before they start looking at you and saying gee i wonder if to be you know they're defaming your reputation if you're someone who does an honest ethical job you should be outraged by that uh, but again you have a limited voice compared to of course you know what the other side has well i th i think we have to clean our industry too we have to do better and i feel like honestly contractor like even at, you know my conference we just did a conference um last week one of the comments that i have jason raisman from used to surfing sent me a text message he said dimitri i love this i like industry is changing too we have you know, like the image of the contractor, image of the roofer back in the day was who was like, it's a college uh, school, high school dropout as a drunk. It's right. So now we have educated people. We have smart people. We have people from other industry coming in, joining. So the average roofer image is changing. We have, it's more lucrative. You can make money. You, you know, it's not as rough as it used to be. You just have to do the right thing. You have to learn how to manage money. You have to be a good contractor. But I feel like industry is changing. It is uh, more difficult than ever to work with insurance companies. And I feel like contractors are making a mistake putting all eggs in one basket and, you know, creating a business model, you know, hoping that insurance payouts always going to be there. Uh, you know, there, there's it's a complicated issue. I mean, insurance companies cannot also be looked as, you know, just deep pockets or like I'm in business for your money. So they're going to be defensive. They're going to as a business owners, they're going to do everything they can to uh, to make it as you know harder to pay out. I mean, we're all guilty in it. It's a, in any conflict. There's always, uh, you know, both sides are wrong. But of course, as a contractor myself, I do see them being in a bigger problem, but we cannot be biased. We cannot be talking only about them. For me personally, as a media company, I have to cover both stories. They make wrong, we have to talk about them. We have outrageous story within us, we also cannot close our eyes on it. And that's the only way for me to expose this nasty relationship that we have. I, mean, I think greed, is the biggest problem in the industry on all ends. Greed, contractors greed, insurance greed, it's all greed. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree 100%. And, and, and who gets hurt? The policyholder. Policy and holder. what is the, the number one rule when we talk about integrity is the litmus test you use is what is in the best interest of the policyholder. And we have this, you know, the part of the presentation, like I said, that anytime I speak to people in the industry, my first slide is, your integrity matters most. And we talk about old school business ethics, which I learned from my parents. I'm sure you learned from your parents, but we can't assume that this generation, the helicopter, and I'm sorry to say our generation taught it to their kids. I know I taught it to my kids. It's all about old school business ethics, which is what's in the best interest of the consumer is number one. You do what's right, even if you lose money, you know, you'll make it up later. If you make a mistake, you be honest about it and you make it right. Even if you lose money, you do business for the long run. You know, you don't be a short game to play the short game. Be it, it. Nobody likes those kind of people. I remember when I first got into the investment world, having some old timer and I was a, you know, 25 year old kid saying, listen, most people don't last in this business. If you do business for the long run, You'll be here for the long run. So those are critical things that we have to make sure we are teaching to the next generation. Because the guy who's hammering shingles on your roof today, who's running a crew, who's you know your sales manager, one day will be an owner. 
And we have to prepare them for that and to be honest and ethical. And I will say this, America is a great country, right, Dimitri? The best country in the world. The best country in the world. Yep, thank you. You can get rich here. You can do it honestly and ethically. And you can have a little extra to give back to people who aren't as lucky as you. And if you can do those three things, in my book, you're successful. But if you can't do the honest and ethical piece, get the fuck out of the business. Because you're hurting people. And you're hurting not just what I have to do, because again, I got to worry about, I'm over here facing one of the most powerful industries in the country, and I got to worry about what people behind me are doing, you know, because it's so easy for them to point that, you know, and they're hurting your reputation. You're damaging the reputation of people who do get up and do honest, ethical job and give back to their community and are raising their families, and they've got to get their name dragged through shit and see have their kids see a billboard saying report contractor fraud because there's people out there that aren't smart enough or ethical enough or hardworking enough to do it the right way. Let's wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining us today. How can someone join you? What's your goals for 2024? How can we support you? How can we join you? What can we do uh, to help spread your message? Well, certainly what you're doing, allowing us to get the message out is very, very helpful. Uh, And then above and beyond that, people can join. If you want to be a member of the APA, that's what funds us. Again, we don't take money from the government. We don't take money from the insurance industry. It allows us to get our message out there and allows us to hold the insurance industry accountable, point the finger at what they're doing wrong instead of just blaming everybody else. Uh, And you can go to APAssociation.org, click on members. You know, you can be a professional member. It's as low as $84 a month. And what I say is, you know, if you like what we're doing, holding the insurance industry accountable, it's the cost of a cup of coffee a day. Buy us a cup of coffee. And I'm not talking bougie stuff like Starbucks, you know, 7-Eleven coffee, $84 a month. It's a way, if you make a good living in this industry, it's a way that you can give back to, because the people who put food on your table, your customers, are getting it taken advantage of by one of the most powerful industries in America. And we need to step up for them. And the saying we have at APA headquarters is, who? You know, if not now, when? Who is in a better position to defend them? So again, it's a way that you can give back. And it's not the only way. Listen, there's lots of great organizations out there. There's lots of great charities out there. I know a lot of people do stuff through their church to give back, et cetera. Great. Give back somehow. Uh, we're one of the ways that you can. We're not the only way. But, you know, APAssociation.org, um, you know, if you want to be a part, come, you know, we, we're very clear about what's going on here is wrong. Average Americans who on their best day are in no position to stand up to a billion dollar insurance company uh, are getting taken advantage of. And we need to step up and help them. So we plant our flag on the hill and say, this is this is what we're about. Pick up your rifle and come join us. Uh, and again, it's, you know, funding is important. We get all our intelligence from the people who are boots on the ground. Because again, I'm not in the industry. I don't see the crime the way you do. So we, our members are the ones that feed us these cases that we develop and turn over to public prosecutors. So by all means, if you are inspired with what we're doing, if you think it should be done, and if you don't, that's fine too. You know, give your money somewhere else, you know, give back somehow. But by all means, if you like what we're doing, if you're inspired, come join the team. Thank you so much, Doug. Keep fighting the good fight. Appreciate you guys.